turn to 413. Let's stand and sing. Sound the battle cry. 413. Anyway, but 
Uh, our space is limited back there, so uh, with what we have, we have three workers that work the nursery, and then we have somebody that helps with the food, and uh, those are usually the four people that we want in the nursery. We don't want anybody else. Now, if we have parents that come, and sometimes they do this, last year I don't think we had much of a problem, but we usually have somebody stand here in the hall, and uh, we try to get a big, you know, muscular guy that just looks tough. And so Wayne, I think we volunteered him for it. <laughs> He's ready to get it. <laughs> now, we just try to get somebody to stand in the hall. That way, if parents start walking back that way, we can direct them. Because parents should only be coming in here. No parents should be going back there. They have uh, only people going back there, especially to start with, are workers dropping their kids off. So uh, anyway, if you have any questions, you can track me down, but we don't make exceptions. Now, I will say this. If parents have their young children here uh, and they want to carry them around and see things that's going on, that's great. That's, we're happy to have that. Uh, they want to push them in a stroller, but we just we can't be a uh, babysitting service for the younger age group. So uh, if anybody asks a question, you can direct them to me, but that is the plan. There's just no way to do it, and we can't make an exception for that. Um, Let's see here. Also, next coming up this coming week, uh, next Sunday is Father's Day. So we've got a lot happening in a very short period of time. And then uh, July 4th and July 11th, we're planning on having uh, some services here. Our evening service, we're planning to move that at 2 o'clock and have a meal on the grounds uh, for those times. And I know camp starts on the 12th, uh, so that will give them a little bit extra time, too, to prepare there for camp. But be aware of the camp date changes. Uh, I do have those if you need them. Uh, teens are going to be first. Uh, I announced that juniors were going to be first, and then the teens were going to be at the end of the month. But they switched that. So they are short of workers uh, because they had to make that change. So if you would like to work camp, uh, please let me know. And even some of the teenagers, if you'd like to work the uh, junior camp, uh, I'm sure they would, wouldn't mind you helping out with that at all. Uh, but let me know, and we can get that arranged for you. Um, I want to mention also we do have food in the basement, uh, food uh, for, left over from the wedding. Uh, we tried to get devour it. I said get rid of it. We tried to devour it that way as much as we could this afternoon. But there's still some left over. I don't know what it, what's down there. Uh, I think we were going to put it in the activity building. So if you go down there, there's nothing in the basement. No, it's basement. It's basement. Okay. We moved it there. We moved it there. Okay. Sorry. We're good. Sorry. Yeah. No, no, that's fine. Okay. No. As long as we know where it's at. <laughs> And, uh, but it'll be in the basement, and we do have some to-go boxes if you'd like to box it up. Uh, but whatever's down there, you can help yourself to. Um, let's see here. Just trying to remember if there's anything else. We'll probably the rest of it we'll, we can address uh, during the meeting. Uh, if you didn't get your shirt, I think everybody got their shirts uh, today. Uh, I'm guessing. There's a few workers, but I think it's Okay, so you can see Beth after church as far as workers if you didn't get your shirt. Um, uh, be in prayer for uh, Cold Wars this week. We always want to be in prayer. We want God to get the glory. You know, just to say this, we've done this now. This is our 15th year for Cold Wars. They've done other things before Cold Wars, but this is our 15th year for Cold Wars. If we take this for granted, God can take it away anytime. Yeah. And you know, I've, I've seen churches, I know of churches that have had nice youth ministries, and now there's nothing. Uh, you know, it's great to have young people coming. We want to minister to young people. But you need to have every age group represented. We need our seniors. We need families. And we need young people. And Cold War is the time where we can minister to young people. Most people, I can't remember what the percent is, but that's like 85% of people who get saved got saved, you know, under the age of 18. Uh, so that's a tremendous opportunity for us to get the gospel there. So we have a huge job to do, and God has blessed it. Uh, and you know, we're just going to keep doing this as long as God wants us to. And we're going to keep doing the things he wants us to and let him guide and lead. If he wants us to change the stuff, we will. Uh, but whatever we do, let's not, uh, as the Bible says, settle on our leaves and just kind of let things go and think it's always going to be this way. If we don't pray and we're not prepared spiritually, then we have nothing to offer these young people when they come. And I don't care if you're not doing the preaching. You might be just helping in the parking lot. You might be doing game time. But every one of us needs to be prepared spiritually so we don't give the devil any avenue at all 
to try to get in and cause havoc and cause problems. If we're doing what God wants us to do, the devil's going to fight anyway. But we don't want to be the result of that. We don't want to be the cause of that. I mean, not the result. We don't want to be the cause of that. So let's be prepared spiritually as much as we can and just let God use us however he sees fit. And uh, because this is what a blessing it is. You think of all these years we've done cold wars and one life, just one soul getting saved and spending eternity in heaven. Well, I'll tell you what, it's worth every bit of effort, energy that's been put into it. But we've had numerous young people saved and a lot of people's lives touched because of it. And uh, so God has seen fit to bless it and let's not ever take it for granted. And I know sometimes you hear me say this each year, but it, it's so easy to take God's blessings for granted like it's always going to be there. But it, he chooses to bless or not bless. And uh, it's, we just want to make sure that he's not going to not bless us because it's not anything that we're doing. And uh, just because it would be his will. So anyway, let's make sure that we're prayed up and, and pray for safety, pray for uh, all the spiritual food and nourishment the young people will get through the week. And I know... Uh, God will be pleased with all that's said and done. Um, we always need workers for the 8 to 11 year old group uh, dealing with the young people. We always can use some workers there. There may be some nights where you don't have anybody to deal with, but it would be better to be more prepared than not prepared at all. It's, it's so much more difficult trying to deal with five or six kids at one time for salvation. And I will say this, when you deal with them, the young people, we don't take them outside. We all take them down in the classrooms. We don't close doors. The doors stay open. And the best way to do it is have the kids' backs to the door so that you have your you can see the door, see what's going on. That way the kids as little distractions as possible, and you can deal with them. We want to try to get them one-on-one -on -one if we can. And we'll probably have two or three in the same room, so just try not to talk over each other. But um, anyway, we'll do what we have to do. And... Uh, We'll address a little bit of that here later on as well. Um, I think that's all that I have right now, and we'll get a little bit more into it here in our meeting with some of the stuff for Cold Wars. It's good having the beans here with us, and I had a great message this morning. I'll tell you what, it was great. Uh, wonderful how he brought all that together, and look forward to another blessing tonight. And Brother Nate always does a great job, and his family is always a blessing. And it's amazing, <clears throat> they just seem to keep multiplying. And uh, that's a blessing to win as well. Trying to build our church. That's right. You build it one, one soul at a time. And, uh, and some of you might, might learn some things from that. You know, I know some of you say you're done. Hey, God's not done. Yeah. <laughs> let's remember that. <laughs> let's all stand. Let's welcome one another to our service, and then we'll prepare for our Sunday night. <laughs>
Jock has prospered you and is going to have to see the people of my friend Jock. Father, we come before you again. Thank you so much for allowing us to come to your house, our Father. Just thank you for the many blessings that you showered down upon us, our Father. And we just pray this week that your hand will be upon yes. our church and <clears throat> Cold Wars, our Father, and all those young ones that will come, that you'll stir in their hearts, that they can know eternal salvation, our Father. Yes. We just yes. give you all the praise, honor, and glory for all of it that you've been a part of and done over the last several years, our Father, because without you, none of it would be possible, our Father. We just pray that you'll be with this offering and we'll continue to use it for the uplifting of our, your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Did you all struggle with those high notes as much as I did? <laughs> I heard myself squeaking up here. I thought I was going through puberty again. <laughs> it was terrible. Yeah, at old age, you just start going in reverse again. <laughs> well, Jody's smart. He just quit singing. <laughs> I at least attempted it a couple of times. Anyway, we're just making a joyful noise unto the Lord. Um, well, how about uh, before uh, we have our special and before uh, Brother Nate comes up, I wonder if we have any of our young people or any of our adults who would like to say some memory verses. Our young people, if you want to come on up. Anybody got any? Now, I know after this week, you guys are going to have some. we got a couple. Okay, come on up. Nate has got one. That if thou shalt confess with thine mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Romans 10, 9. Amen. Amen. Boy, 
voice of a stranger, or he would lead us on to despair. Following on with Jesus our Savior, we shall all reach that country so fair. Going up home to live in green pastures, where we shall live and die nevermore. Even the Lord will be in that number when we shall reach that. Towns and the inhabitants of Dor and her towns. 
the inhabitants of Endor and her towns, and the inhabitants of Tanakh and her towns, and the inhabitants of Megiddo and her towns, even three countries. Yet the children of Manasseh could not drive out the inhabitants of those cities, but the Canaanites would dwell in that land. Yet it came to pass that when the children of Israel were waxen strong, that they put the Canaanites to tribute, but did not utterly drive them out. With the Lord's help tonight, I would like to preach on the subject of the daughters of Zelophehad. The daughters of Zelophehad. Let's pray and ask the Lord's blessing in our time together. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray now that you would take your word and make it understandable to us. Make it alive to us because we know that it is living, it's quick, it's powerful, and it's sharper than a two-edged sword. Lord, this is, what we have just read is the word of Almighty God. And I pray that we would reverence your word tonight. I pray that we would receive it with, with eagerness, with faith, with um, understanding that this is, uh, Lord, it's precious beyond measure to hear the word of God. And I pray that we would um, be willing to... Respond as you lead us. And Father, I pray now that you would take the message and use it for your glory. I don't know what's going on in people's hearts and lives tonight. I, I, uh, there's so many circumstances and situations and burdens and needs. And Lord, you know each one with perfect knowledge. And so I pray as you've led us here to this text, that you would take the message and customize it to the needs of the hour. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Whenever we study the scriptures, and I hope that you do study the scriptures, as we study the scriptures, we have to remember that the Bible is predominantly a Jewish book, especially the Old Testament. The Old Testament was given to the Jews. And while all of it is written for us, right, as, as Gentiles, I assume that most of us are Gentiles here tonight and not Jewish in our heritage, as Gentiles... We have to understand, while all of it is written for our benefit and for our learning, it was not all written to us. Okay, And we need to understand that if we're going to rightly divide the Word of God as we are commanded to. The Bible was not written down by Western Christians. right? It wasn't written down by American Baptists, was it? No, it was recorded and written down by Middle Eastern Jews. Okay, And there are... Things that we come across that are unique to Jewish culture and unique to Middle Eastern culture that to us as Americans, it, it seems foreign to us. And, and that's okay, but we have to recognize it. We have to learn these things. In order to understand the context, especially the Old Testament and, and, the, and some of the Jewish traditions and practices and, 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 and things like that, it can be helpful for us to consult Jewish sources to learn about their culture and traditions. For example, it's interesting uh, and enlightening to learn about um, the, the Jewish wedding customs. And you study that and you find about, you, you read about the customs that they would have, about how a groom would, 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 would uh, become engaged to his bride and then he would go back to his, his father's house and he would prepare and build the house and he would, he would do all that he could to make ready until his father said, okay, it's ready, it's time, go and get your bride. And the bride's responsibility was to make herself prepared for the arrival of her bridegroom. And when you study those cultures and those traditions um, behind the Jewish people, and then you read about how Jesus said, I go to my father's house. In my father's house are many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. When you see the, the context and the culture, oh, it, it, it makes it come alive. Yeah. Okay, do you see what I'm saying? Now, as we do these things, uh, we all, I will often in my studies consult, uh, for example, a, a, a book, a set of books called the Jewish Encyclopedia. It could be very helpful. But we need to realize, and we need to realize that while learning from Jewish sources can be insightful, Jewish sources apart from Christ are not gifted with a special insight to Scripture. Okay? As a Christian, I love the Jewish people, and I have a love for the nation of Israel, and I hope that you do also. Uh, but right now, the Jewish people, the Bible tells us they are in blindness because they've rejected their Messiah. Okay, they don't. 
they don't they have blinders on. They don't understand the truth about Christ. And so while we can look at the Jewish encyclopedia and learn certain things, we have to be careful because these people are blinded spiritually. All right? We need to be discerning when we consult Jewish sources. And by the way, we need to be discerning when we consult any source outside of Scripture, right? I, I mean, even if, even if I, or Pastor Walt, were to write a Bible study book and give it to you, you still need to read it with discernment because we're fallible men and we make mistakes. Yeah. The Bible is the only infallible, perfect book, okay? Now, you may say, all right, what does all this have to do with our text here this evening in Joshua chapter 17? Well, I was reading this some time ago, and I got to thinking, what is this all about? The, the, these daughters of Zelophehad are, are asking for an inheritance, and there's laws and provisions that are made, and it's recorded in the scripture, and we know it's got to have a meaning for us. What's it all about? And so I, I went online to do some research on these passages, and, 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 and as I searched for Joshua 17 and Zelophehad and the daughters of Zelophehad, um, I came across the... There's not a lot written from Christians on this subject, but there's an awful lot of Jewish writings on this subject. So I thought, okay, well, let's see what they have to say. And I'm reading some things. And um, I was mildly surprised at what I came across, though I probably should not have been surprised. Most modern Jewish writers portray these daughters of Zelophehad as the first feminists, standing up against the systematic oppression of their patriarchal culture. One commentator that I read, a Jewish commentator, claimed that these women should be regarded as heroes along other feminist, alongside other feminist leaders like Margaret Sanger, who founded Planned Parenthood. Now that is ridiculous, is it not? Uh, let me pause here and say, Planned Parenthood is responsible for the murder of millions of babies. It's right up there with the Chinese Communist Party as one of the most evil organizations in existence. Okay? Wicked. However, when you read something like that, you say, well, we know, I know it can't mean that. Right? I know the Bible's not promoting stuff like that. That's not what this is all about. But it makes you wonder, okay, well, what does it mean? I know that's wrong, but what's right? These daughters of Zelophehad are mentioned five times in Scripture. Isn't that interesting? Uh, that's more than a lot of people that, that, that we find and, and hear preaching about. They're mentioned five times. They're mentioned in Numbers chapter 26, Numbers 27, Numbers 33. They're mentioned here in Joshua 17, and then they're mentioned in 1 Chronicles chapter 7. One article that I read from Charisma magazine, okay, you can figure out where they, where they are coming from, right, or Charismatic, they praised these women as God-ordained troublemakers who defy the patriarchal system of the day. And they say that women in Israel live like prisoners in their tents covered in heavy veils from head to foot. And the writer said that the reason pastors don't deal with this account is because they're afraid of empowering women. Now, is that so? <laughs> Some of you are looking at me wondering what I'm, where I'm going with this. <laughs> Has Christianity failed women? What does the Bible teach about women and their role in home and society? Now, there's certainly a large variety of opinions on this, and I, my point, this is not where I'm going with the message, right? But let me point out, there are extremes on both sides of the spectrum, right? I've recently read some awful, heartbreaking accounts of how abuse, whether it be sexual, emotional, mental, spiritual abuse, is widespread throughout Christianity, even in Baptist churches. And in many cases, horrible acts of abuse against women have been enabled and covered up by leaders of large institutions. Right? Churches, colleges. Sometimes the leaders have been willfully complicit and even guilty themselves. Other times, I believe, good men have failed uh, to handle matters correctly. Maybe they were ignorant, maybe they dropped the ball, but they were good men who made mistakes. But I want to say emphatically this evening that men are not free to impose their will upon women, abusing and harassing them in any way. That type of behavior is absolutely ungodly, and it is to be reproved, not covered up. There are those in fundamental circles who teach that women are to be subservient to men in all realms of society and that men in positions of authority are never to be questioned. I reject that. That is not scriptural. That's extreme. Okay? 
But then there's another common position that is on the opposite extreme, the opposite end of the spectrum, and that is the position that men and women are absolutely equal in all ways. The, the theological term, if you're interested, for that is called egalitarianism. Okay? It means that uh, those who would espouse that position would believe that um, the husband's not the head of the home, the husband and wife are both head of the home. Okay? And uh, they would say that, oh, women can pastor or men can pastor, men and women are equal, it doesn't matter. Okay? A woman can pastor or a man can pastor, and, and both would have equal validity. Okay? But the biblical position is neither of those two extremes. Sure. Okay? The Bible position is that while men and women are on equal footing before God, we have different realms of responsibility yeah. and authority. Okay? Those differences have been designed by God. You think God knows what he's doing? Amen. Of course he does. In the Garden of Eden, God created Eve to be a helper who was meek or suitable for Adam. And so the term for this position is called complementarianism. That is, men and women are equal before God, but we have different authorities and different responsibilities and different gifts and so on. Okay? God has given men certain responsibilities and authorities that he has not given to women. That does not mean that men are superior to women sure. in any way. Okay? We're equal but different. Galatians 3.28 says there's neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither bond nor free, there's neither male nor female, for you're all one in Christ Jesus. That is to say, we all, my, my prayers as a man are not different from your, your prayers as a woman. Okay, God doesn't hear my prayers more or less. Okay, uh, Men don't get saved differently than women. Men don't have um, a, a, a straighter path to God than women or vice versa. We're equal before God. We're saved the same way. We're by grace through faith. But God's given us different responsibilities, different authorities, and different roles. Okay? Now, all of this is an introduction, but I felt like it needed to be said because this is a passage of Scripture that, when it is used, is generally misused. Okay? Right. So, now, where are we going to go with this? What are, what are we going to see? The text before us is not an example of God-ordained troublemakers challenging a system of oppression. Rather, this is an example of five women of faith who did not want to be left out of God blessing their families. They didn't want to miss out on what God had promised to his people, what God had promised to the nation. All right, now let's back up and we're going to work our way through this and we're going to see uh, what is going on and what it means for us here tonight. Okay? In Numbers chapter 26, okay, in that chapter we find that God is giving Moses instructions as to how the land is to be divided. If you were here this morning, you may remember that we talked about how the promised land was divided among the tribes of Israel, and each tribe received a large portion of land, and then that portion of land was divided to the individual family groups. Okay? And God's telling Moses how all of this needs to take place. Okay, let me read to you Numbers 26, beginning in verse 52. The Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Unto these the land shall be a divided for inheritance according to the number of names. To many thou shalt give the more inheritance, to few thou shalt give the less inheritance. To every one shall his inheritance be given according to those that were numbered of him. Okay? Now, here's basically what that means. Okay? Large families receive more land than small families. Okay? Large communities receive a larger portion of land than smaller families. Communities, okay, and, and so everybody received that which was according to their size. And here's the general rule that would follow is what is called the land inheritance. And, and, and the, way, the way that that would follow is that the land would be passed down from father to son. Thus ensuring that the land would remain in the same family. And so serious was God about this that God instituted something called the year of jubilee. In which, if you, maybe you got into financial trouble and you had to sell your land, every 50th year, any land that had been sold would go back to its original ownership uh, so that the land would stay with the family to whom it was promised. Okay? This was important to God. It was important to Israel. Uh, this was a big deal, this land ownership. Okay? If a man 
married a woman from another tribe. Let's say a man from the tribe of Judah married a woman from the tribe of Gad. Okay, yes, that really is a tribe. Okay, and, and so these two get married. Okay, they, that, they were fine. They could do that. If a man married a woman from another tribe, she would become part of his tribe, not the other way around. Right. Okay, this system was ordained by God. This was a good system. It had purpose. It had meaning. And now as Moses is going through the manner in which the land is going to be divided, we find that Moses is approached by five women. Okay? And I don't know what was going through Moses' mind when, when these women came to him and, and, and they had this, this concern that they wanted to bring to him. But these five women were daughters of a man named Zelophehad, who was the great-great-grandson of Manasseh, the son of Joseph. Okay, so Joseph was this man's great, great, great grandpa. Okay, tribe of Manasseh. And these five sisters are concerned about what's going to happen to the legacy of their father. Because he did not have any sons. He only had daughters. And land is passed from father to son under this law. Okay? The family had a right to the land. But who's going to legally inherit this? These, these ladies are saying, well, what's going to happen to our inheritance from our father? Our father died in the wilderness, but, but we, there's this land that's been promised to him. What's going to happen? Notice, let me read this to you. Numbers 27, verse 3. It says, Our father died in the wilderness. He was not in the company of them that gathered themselves together against the Lord in the company of Korah, but died in his own sin and had no sons. All right? They said, Moses, our father perished in the wilderness. By the way, this event here with Moses taking place at the end of the wilderness wanderings, before they enter into Canaan, Moses is still alive, and this is one of his final acts as the leader of Israel. And these women come to Moses and they say, Moses, our father's dead. But he was not a part of the rebellion. Remember the story of Korah and how he led a rebellion against Moses and all these people died because of the rebellion? He wasn't part of that. No, he was on equal footing with all the other men of Israel. Nothing to distinguish him. No, there was no, no mark against him. There was no curse upon him. He was the same as everybody else. Therefore, his family had a right to expect to inherit a share of land. And so these women petitioned Moses. That they would receive their fair share. And Moses doesn't know what to do. So he brings their petition before the Lord. By the way, isn't that the right thing to do? <coughs> when you don't know what to do, right. you say, let me pray about it. Right? And, 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 if, and, if, and, and generally speaking, if someone's not willing to let you pray about it, the answer is no. Yeah. Right? I mean, I've, had, I've been in places where somebody said, hey, uh, I'll sell you this and the price is good now. And I'll say, well, let me go pray about it and come back. No, the price is only good now. I already know my answer. Right? I, I gotta pray about it. Uh, so Moses doesn't know what to do. And so he's gonna pray about it. Right? And um, he brings the petition before the Lord, and God reveals to Moses these, these women are right in their request. They have a right to receive a portion of the land as an inheritance. And so God gives Moses an additional set of laws concerning the land. He says, if a man has no sons, then their daughters can inherit their father's land. And if he has no daughters, then he is to go to his brothers. And if he has no brothers, then he is to go to his uncle or their descendants, basically the next closest of kin. All right, now with all that in mind, let's turn to Numbers chapter 36. If you would please, Numbers 36. And let's read verses 1 through 4. Okay, this is... I mean, this is the very end of Moses' life. This is the very end of the law here. Numbers 36. And the chief fathers of the families of the children of Gilead, the sons of Machir, the sons of Manasseh, of the families of the sons of Joseph, came near and spake before Moses and before the princes, the chief fathers of the children of Israel. And they said, The Lord commanded my Lord to give the land for inheritance by lot to the children of Israel. My Lord was commanded by the Lord to give the inheritance of Zelophehad, our brother, unto his daughters, and if they be married to any of the sons of the other tribes of the children of Israel, then shall their inheritance be taken from the inheritance of our fathers and shall be put to the inheritance of the tribe where they are received. 
So shall it be taken from the law of our inheritance. When the jubilee of the children of Israel shall be, then shall the inheritance be put into the inheritance of the tribe whereunto they are received. So shall their inheritance be taken away from the inheritance of the tribe of our fathers. Okay, what's going on? We find Zelophehad's has other relatives, okay, of the tribe of Manasseh. They find out what these five women went and asked Moses for and what the, the concession that Moses gave to them. And they're concerned about this. They say, wait, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. They say, now you, Moses, you commanded Zelophehad's inheritance to be given to his daughters, but what if they marry men from some other tribe? Do you remember what we said? When a woman married a man from another tribe, she would become part of his tribe, not the other way around. So what if they marry somebody from some other tribe, and then all this inheritance within our tribe becomes part of this other tribe's inheritance? And the confusion that that will cause and how that will undermine our community here. Okay, you see how that could be a problem? The land is supposed to stay within our family, but it will go outside of our family. And so Moses takes their concern into consideration. And he adds to this ruling in verse 5. This was given by God. Moses commanded the children of Israel according to the word of the Lord, saying, The tribe of the sons of Joseph hath said, Well, and so he goes on and here's what he says. Okay, to summarize, he says, all right, the women can keep their inheritance as long as they marry within their own tribe. If they marry outside their own tribe, they're free to do that, but they forfeit their inheritance because the land must remain within the tribe. The five sisters agree to this, and they all take husbands from within their tribe, and all is well. All right? Now, back in Joshua chapter 17, you remember that we're in the midst of reading of how the land is divided among the various tribes and we, we talked some about that this morning. And, and how in and Joshua 16 and 17 deal with the land given to Ephraim and Manasseh, the tribes descended from the sons of Joseph. In, in Joshua 17 and verse 4, back here we read that the same sisters okay, who were given this promise by Moses, they come to Joshua and Eliezer the priest to remind them of Moses' promise. And Joshua sees to it that they receive their fair portion of the land. All right, now, what are we going to learn from this? Okay, there's something for us, I promise. What is it? Several things. First of all, there's this very simple practical application. Then there's an important theological application. Practically, think of this. These women were concerned about a situation in which they felt that they may have been wrongfully left out. Okay? They felt like they were being almost cheated. Not intentionally, but this is not fair. This is not right. There's a problem here. And so they brought their concern before Moses. Then after that happened, their relatives were concerned about what might happen, what might happen as well. So they brought their concern before Moses. And as I was studying this, this stood out to me. In both cases, their concerns and their troubles were resolved directly and peacefully. We don't find, uh, in either case, tempers flaring. We don't find accusations made. We don't find people pointing fingers and, and backbiting and name-calling and, 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 and dragging people through the mud. The sisters were concerned, so they came to Moses. Moses gave them an audience, and he listened, and he took action. The relatives were concerned, so they came to Moses. He heard them out. He listened. He took action. And just like that, the matter was resolved. Now, this situation could have been a big problem. I mean, it could have caused a huge contention among the tribe of Manasseh. I mean, it, could have set, it could have started a war. This could have set, I mean, you read about some wars that have been started over stupid things. This certainly could have caused a war, right? And, and yet, we find that it was resolved peacefully. It's a great example to us of what do we do when we have concerns. How do we handle it? How do you raise your concerns to an authority? And how do you deal with concerns when you are an authority? There are going to be times in your life when you find yourself in the position of these sisters. You see something taking place around you. Maybe it involves you. Maybe it's not. And, and you something's been overlooked and there's a problem and you're concerned about it. What are you going to do? Take it to Facebook, man. <laughs> no. Should you air your grievances to people who have nothing to do with it? 
No. Should you keep it to yourself and then later on when it blows up say, ah, I knew it was going to happen? No. I would encourage you to follow the example of these sisters in an appropriate, humble way. Bring your concern before the ones responsible for making the decision. Say something like this. Hey, I've been thinking about all that's been taking place and I'm concerned about a few things. Can I share them with you? Don't go on a rampage, but give that person the benefit of the doubt. They're not out to get you. Give the person the benefit of the doubt. Believe that they want to do what's best. Okay? Perhaps your boss didn't consider these things. Perhaps your pastor, it never occurred to him. But he wants to know so that he can make a right decision, right? This doesn't guarantee that the person in authority will handle things in the way you think it ought to be handled. Doesn't guarantee that they'll respond correctly. But it's the biblical way to handle it when you have concerns. But then there's going to be also be times when you find yourself in the position of Moses. There'll be times when you're the decision maker, maybe as a parent, maybe as a boss, maybe as a teacher, and, and, and you've made a plan, and someone comes to you and says, wait a minute, wait a minute, I have some concerns. What are you going to do? Some people act like no one has a right to ever question them. And any question or concern that's expressed, that's rebellion. You better sit down and be quiet. You ever come across people like that in authority? Yeah. It's not good to say. People who act that way have an unhealthy view of authority, an unbiblical view of authority, and they tend to be drunk on their own power. That's right, yes. When you are in a position in which you are the decision maker, let me challenge you to be willing to listen and consider the concerns of others. If you're the boss, listen to your workers. Okay, Take, it, take into account what they have to say. If you're a teacher and your student says, I, what? I'm concerned about this, listen to them. It doesn't mean you do whatever they want, but listen to them and take into consideration and pray about it. As a parent, make a way for your children to respectfully seek out clarification if they're concerned about something you said. Right, yes. I'm not talking about griping and complaining. I'm talking about teaching them how to make a humble entreaty, mm -hmm. like the examples in our story. Your kids need that. That's right. They need it. But there's one other thing that I want to point out as we come to the end here. A matter that shows to us the beautiful intricacy and accuracy of Scripture. All right, I want to turn to a few more passages, if you would humor me for a few moments. Okay? Would you look with me in Matthew chapter 1? Matthew chapter 1. In Matthew chapter 1, we find the legal lineage of Jesus Christ. It traces his ancestry from Abraham down to Joseph, his adopted father. In Matthew chapter 1, look at verses 15 and 16. I want to show you something. Okay? Notice what it says in verse 15. Eliud begat Eliezer. Eliezer begat Mathan. And Mathan begat Jacob. And Jacob begat Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called the Christ. Okay, now pay attention to that. Joseph's father was named what? Jacob. Okay. His grandfather was named Nathan. And Matthew explains that Jesus was not begotten of Joseph. Right? It says, the husband of Mary of whom was born Jesus. That's important. Right? Joseph did not beget Jesus. Okay? Now, with that in mind, look at Luke chapter 3. Luke chapter 3. Verse 23. Luke 3, 23. All right. And Jesus himself began to be about 30 years of age, being as was supposed the son of Joseph, which was the son of Heli, which was the son of Mephat, which was the son of Levi, which was the son of Melchi, which was the son of Janna, which was the son of Joseph. All right, here we find Joseph is called not the son of Jacob, the son of Nathan, but rather the son of Heli, the son of Mephat. Is that a contradiction? No. Notice it does not say Heli begat Joseph. 
but it says Joseph was the son of Eli. Notice in the King James Bible, the words be son are in italics, meaning they're supplied for our understanding. But the literal way this is written is Joseph, which was of Eli. Now, why? Why is this important? This is not Joseph's physical genealogy. This is Mary's family tree that we're reading here. Joseph was of the same tribe of Mary, was the son-in-law of Eli. Are you with me? Now, why is this important, and what does it have to do with Joshua chapter 17? Well, we just learned the inheritance had to remain in the tribe, Right? And it could, under certain circumstances, be passed down through the mother, provided that she married within her tribe. Did you know it was the same with authority and the right to rule? Jesus was not a physical descendant of Joseph, but he was born of Mary. And just as the daughters of Zelophehad had to marry within their own tribe in order that their inheritance would be passed down to their sons, so Mary had to marry within her own tribe in order for Jesus to have a legal claim to the throne of David. If Joseph had been of any other tribe, the claims of Jesus could be contested, and he would not have the legal right to sit on the throne of David. Are you with me? Do you see, that is such a minute detail of the law. I would imagine most of us had never even heard of it or thought of it until tonight. But God did. And even the most minute of details of the law were fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Now why is that important? Because the Bible says in Romans chapter 10 and verse 4, Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to all who believe. It's like Christ fulfilled the law so that we could receive grace. We could never fulfill the law. Are you kidding me? You read things like that? How? We could never come up with all the details of the law that we would have to fulfill in order to fulfill the law. The Bible says, if you keep the whole law but you offend in one point, you're guilty of all. Cursed is everyone who is under the law. But Jesus Christ came under the law and was made a curse for us so that we might receive the adoption of sons. And do you know what adoption pertains to? It pertains to inheritance, like we talked about this morning, so that all of the all of the blessings could be passed down through Christ to us legally, because he fulfilled the law. Listen, we are incapable of keeping the law. We are lawbreakers. But Jesus fulfilled it for us. And the law is our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. And when we read in Joshua chapter 17 about the daughters of Zelophehad and how, how they were concerned about their inheritance and all these laws that had to be made, if we study, we find that it points us to the Lord Jesus Christ who fulfilled every detail of the law so that we could be welcomed in God's grace. Jesus did what we never could so that we could be redeemed and saved. And we're not under that law, we're under God's grace. Because of that, there's acceptance, there's liberty, there's joy, there's security, there's meaning and purpose to life. All because of Christ. Heavenly Father, thank you for this passage of Scripture. And Lord, I don't know specifically why you let us here, but I pray that you would use it in someone's heart tonight. Meet their need. Or maybe there's someone who's just been struggling with doubts. Help them to see the Bible is accurate, the Bible is right. And if the Bible can be right about these specific details, surely it's right in every aspect to which it speaks. And we can trust the Word of God. Maybe there's someone here who's who's never trusted Christ as Savior, help them to see that under the law there's nothing but condemnation, but in Christ they can be saved from their sins. Lord, help us all to follow these examples of Moses and these women of faith and help us to handle conflict and problems and concerns in a Christ-honoring way. In Jesus' name we pray. Let's all stand with our heads bowed and eyes closed.
mean, that's a, a very meaty message, but it's got a tremendous message to it. Because so often in life, we try to figure things out on our own. We try to work out our own details. And, you know, I think what Christ wants us to see is everything points to Jesus. The Word of God, everything that He allows in our life, it is to bring us to Himself. And that's what He wants. Things that are going on in your life that you don't understand, that may make you angry, upset, bitter, whatever it might be. Christ is simply trying to point you to Himself. Just like in the story. And it all points to Jesus. Won't you let Him do that? Won't you let Him have His way in your life? We're going to sing a song here of invitation. 253. 253. If you'd like to follow along with us. Maybe you'd like to come and pray. Pray for call orders. Pray for the situations going on in your heart and life. And just maybe ask God to open your eyes so you can see Jesus for you. As we sing. I wandered far away.